Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The U.S. has started drawing down forces from Afghanistan, set to pull out of the country by August 31st. It's the end of America's longest war that spans through two decades, if not more. But fighting in Afghanistan has intensified since May. Recently, the Taliban have taken three more provincial capitals in Afghanistan as they forge ahead with a bid to control the country. Many Afghan cities and about half of the country's 34 provinces have been the scene of heavy battles and street fighting. This week, special representatives from Afghanistan, China, the U.S., Russia, and Pakistan will meet in Qatar and other places to resume peace negotiations on the Afghan conflict. Meanwhile, during a recent visit to China, the Taliban's political chief said the group is sincere about seeking peace and is willing to work with other parties for a political arrangement that is acceptable to all Afghan people. For more on the latest in Afghanistan, let's loop in our panelists. For the latest situation in Afghanistan, we are joined in Detroit, Saeed Khan, lecturer of uh, the Near East and Asian Study with Global Studies at Wayne State University in Atlanta, Tabish Flo, who is the Afghan writer and political analyst in Boston, Jim Walsh, a senior research associate at MIT Security Studies Program in Beijing, He Wenping, professor from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to see all of you. Now, latest situation in Afghanistan is changing as we speak. What is your latest assessment, uh, Mr. Flo, since you are, um, you were in Afghanistan at least two years ago? Uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, hello to all of the panelists. Uh, the situation is very much concerning. Uh, the advances of the Taliban around major cities, particularly in Helmand and Lashkar Dagh, but also in the north of the country, in uh, around Aibak, which is perhaps the second largest city in the north, mm. close to Mazar Sharif, and uh, other uh, provincial capitals, is concerning, creating a humanitarian crisis in the midst of a full-scale war. Uh, what is happening is uh, that the Doha deal that supposed to uh, provide a venue for talks and the, the sort of assurances that uh, provides uh, a path to negotiation, mm -hmm. that deal is doomed and failed. The Taliban is uh, the Taliban strategy of uh, waiting out the United States has proved to work. Uh, and now they are focused on the strategy of exhausting uh, Afghanistan's government politically and militarily. So what is happening uh, in Afghanistan is uh, a crisis of many folds. Unfortunately, uh, okay. the cost of this war and the major burden of this war is on the ordinary Afghans who are suffering tens of thousands of people or displaced, internally displaced refugee camps or almost uh, uh, everywhere uh, around major cities like Kandahar and even in, in the capital Kabul. Yeah. Uh, people are fleeing a humanitarian crisis and making. So what is happening uh, is, uh, I think, uh, creating not just a political and military, and military crisis, but also something that the region should be alarmed and should be aware of. Mr. Khan, what is your assessment, particularly when it comes to the region? Well, I think, if, uh, first of all, I, I'm not sure that the, uh, the takeover of the Taliban is much of a surprise, although the speed by which they're doing it is, uh, is quite shocking. They mm. have been uh, uh, very effective uh, in the speed by which they have been able to take over several provincial capitals. But as far as the region is concerned, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. And what we've seen in the past is that when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, there has always been a concern that left to its own devices, uh, whether it was uh, during the 1990s, uh, which spawned the Taliban in the first place, when the United States had pulled its support out after the Soviet uh, invasion and occupation, there was this danger of a vacuum. Now we find, though, that there are enough regional players that if there is some kind of a coordinated 
uh, effort made by countries like Iran, Pakistan, China, of course, uh, perhaps even India. There is the possibility of a stabilization when it comes to Afghanistan. Now, that's not going to prevent mm. uh, the inevitability of the Taliban becoming the dominant force within Afghanistan. But as far as issues of humanitarian crisis, uh, the aversion of anarchy, uh, there is the possibility and the prospect that mm. regional cooperation can and will be an effective measure. I see. Uh, Mr. Walsh, since you are based in the U.S., let me ask you more about the U.S. side. What is exactly that final plan of withdrawal, 22 days or 21 days from now? Meanwhile, what does that mean, the Air Force now uh, that is going on, and later, after the withdrawal, what is the U.S. plan? Well, in some ways, we've seen it both uh, in President Biden's words and in reaction to recent events. So I think many commentators have pointed to the fact that you've had a very accelerated pace, as my colleagues have pointed to, of uh, Taliban military victories on the ground, two top tier cities and then other cities as well. And uh, the U.S. you know, hasn't reversed course and its, its response to most recent events would suggest that it's going to do what it is doing, uh, which is it'll provide air support if the government requests it, but it will continue its withdrawal of assets and people who worked with the U.S. government translators and continue on the path that it's currently on. It is not getting back mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. Let me come back to you, Mr. Floor, about the latest situation in Afghanistan, because for many of us from outside Afghan, it's very hard to understand all the nuances, but there are enormous amount of nuances, even just within the Taliban itself and within, of course, the Afghan government forces itself as well. How should we understand this, Mr. Floor? A war of 40 years is uh, always uh, uh, have to be or is complicated. Uh, do not forget that there is a regional uh, support network, sanctuaries, military and political support provided to the Taliban. This is a fact. But at the same time, internally, uh, Afghans uh, fail to do their homeworks of providing better governance, better services delivered to the public. And this has created a sort of uh, disarray and sort of anarchy that at the time of crisis is not providing the support that a government needs. So mm. there is the possibility of publics switching sides to the Taliban, not just because the Taliban are a popular force, but because the government has been has not been able to provide the security and the safety that is needed for the public to stand and hold on the cities. At the same time, unfortunately, the government of Ghani with his cronies and partners uh, have no sort of grand war plan. They don't have the resilience, they don't have the political acumen and, and, and the resilience in, ten, in terms of strategic thinking to defend Afghanistan and to sort of uh, see the whole picture of not just war, but of course, regional diplomacy, peacemaking, and at the same time, stabilizing the region. Mm -hmm. Throughout the seven years of Ghani's presidency, he has provided this false assurances to people. But what we see is now that that was shallow, empty, and not tangible. And at the same time, the other element of the nuance is that the rash, irresponsible withdrawal of forces uh, from Afghanistan created that political vacuum. And now it's felt not just by the Taliban, but also by the regional actors, which is uh, creating another round, another era of uncertainty and confusion. Mm. Mr. Khan, also about the Afghan government, there has always been a practice that it is only controlling the capital and the surrounding area. That is no secret to anyone in the world anymore. But uh, what about its situation now, given the strongholds of Taliban and the fighting capabilities of Taliban, one must assume there could be a lot of complexities within the so-called government forces and the Afghan government. Absolutely. I think we've seen now that the, uh, the Kabul regime, as uh, Mr. Farooq uh, very uh, uh, eloquently articulated, uh, is really a shell uh, of a regime uh, made more so 
without any kind of an external support for it. Uh, we saw with the Doha talks, uh, there was this rather half-hearted mm -hmm. uh, effort in the closing uh, uh, overs of uh, the Trump administration to try to finally court uh, the Taliban uh, regime to bring it to the negotiation table, perhaps to placate some last minute uh, favors and uh, concessions. Uh, but the Taliban, of course, uh, as has already been said, uh, played the waiting game, they played it very effectively, and they realized that Doha was more for uh, perhaps American domestic consumption than it mm -hmm. really was for changing any facts on the ground. Mm. Is it for more American domestic consumption, including the withdrawal of American forces in such a abrupt way, uh, just within a few months? Uh, and of course, things would change dramatically, uh, Mr. Walsh. Of course, I will also go to the Chinese issue with uh, Madam He, but a bit later, Mr. Walsh. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to be careful here. There are a lot of folks, and we've talked about, well, you and I have talked about Afghanistan many times, and there are a lot of folks who said the U.S. should not be in Afghanistan. International critics in the regions didn't want U.S. troops in Afghanistan. And I get that. But then when they leave, you can't turn around and say, oh, it's terrible, they're leaving, it's causing instability. I mean, you can't have it both ways. So. I think definitely the you know is um, my co one of my colleagues said, and I'm sympathetic to this. You know, yes, the U.S. is leaving quickly, and yes, things are falling quickly. But tell me, you know, how many circumstances do you have where people take their time leaving? You know, that's not the way the thing works. Uh, if you've decided to get out, and there were there was writing on the wall. Trump said it. You know, everyone should have known that when Trump made that initial movement towards getting out, that that was going to pave the way for Biden to do it. The U.S. had been there 20 years, 20 years. Yeah. Dr. Khan, exactly. I have to let you respond to that. I fully agree. And actually, if I may just uh, provide one point of modification, uh, the United States has actually been in Afghanistan in some capacity for the last 42 years, uh, directly uh, with, uh, with military mm -hmm. on the ground, of course, since, uh, since 2001. Uh, but uh, with the military support that it was providing for the Mujahideen going all the way back to 1979. So the kind of fatigue that had set in uh, with the United States, along with, of course, when it comes to the American public, uh, the ill-fated ventures into Iraq and other campaigns uh, in the Middle East, and of course, always the looming specter of Vietnam, uh, which, uh, which festered. And of course, uh, it's no coincidence that parallels are being made uh, to the seemingly hasty withdrawal of American troops now to April of uh, 1975 uh, when Saigon fell and uh, the scenery and the imagery of uh, American helicopters evacuating uh, the embassy in uh, Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City. So uh, these kinds of depictions are ones that are etched uh, quite strongly in the American consciousness mm -hmm. and do in fact then uh, help to drive uh, public opinion, especially one uh, regarding uh, whether America should be in Afghanistan any longer. But the question also was, originally, was it right to be in Afghanistan, at least in Afghanistan in such a way? That's also a question, isn't it, Dr. Khan, briefly? Well, I think historians are going to be debating this uh, probably mm -hmm. for uh, certainly far longer than I'm going to be around. Uh, but at least in the short term, uh, we can say coming up on the 20th anniversary of September 11th and the attacks that there was merit given the fact that Al-Qaeda was uh, in fact uh, located within Afghanistan. Uh, before Osama bin Laden, of course, uh, crossed the border into Pakistan, yeah. that uh, military strikes were uh, going to be necessary, given the fact that at the time uh, the Taliban were harboring al-Qaeda and were unwilling to then uh, extradite uh, Osama bin Laden or any other members of al-Qaeda. I see. Uh, how limited that, uh, that campaign should have been uh, is, of course, the big debate. And uh, certainly it's very hard to justify uh, going well beyond that uh, to being almost 20 years, especially given the fact that uh, bin Laden was uh, was killed uh, 10 years ago and not even in Afghanistan. Yeah. And Mr. Folu, I have to let you come in uh, just to be fair. Uh, I mean, I agree to uh, most of the points by my colleagues, but uh, let's remember also that the U.S. Uh, peace envoy uh, he had this mantra that uh, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. The peace deal with the Taliban should have provided 
uh, let me say that wasn't a peace deal. That was rather a sort of surrender deal, right? An exit deal. That deal should have elements of peacemaking. No one, no one with sane understanding of history and complexity of the region would argue for an infinite presence of the United States in the region. And honestly, as Dr. Khan said, as I'm also a student of history, no international power or foreign force can ever change the fate of a nation. That is for sure, we can agree on this. But what we wanted, or but what partnership meant at the time of making deal with the Taliban was to make sure that we use all the leverages of the United States that had on the table militarily and politically while doing the peace negotiations with the Taliban. At current moment, the United States seems to lose the war and also losing the peace. That is the, 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 the equation that needs to be discussed. And Madam Ho, you've been listening attentively to your colleagues. Uh, your thoughts on this question, the U.S. Uh, presence in Afghanistan, whether it's 20 or 42 years? Well, uh, I think uh, I agree with uh, the, uh, our colleagues in, uh, in uh, you know, Atlanta, maybe. Uh, so I think the uh, United States withdrawal from Afghanistan obviously is too hasty. It's not that responsible at all. Uh, don't mention uh, they have been based there for 20 years, uh, not bring any peace and security in that country. And even the final, uh, this moment, uh, actually uh, just one example. So one of the base, uh, military base, the U.S. troops just withdraw, with, even without any notice to Afghanistan government. Only two or three days later, so when those Afghanistan military forces and came over to that military base, and they found all those American troops has gone. So why is that? Because for the Biden admin administration, the number one concern is to make zero casualty, zero wounded American soldiers you know, in the, all the process of withdrawal. So that uh, is not in their concern to make sure the peaceful trans, you know, trans, uh, you know, transition for this withdrawal. So that's why we, we, we have uh, come uh, across this kind of a civil conflict immediately come up. Ms. He, as the other guests mentioned, Chinese State Council Foreign Minister Wang Yi met already with the Taliban leaders. What is China trying to paint the picture about? Yeah, uh, I don't think uh, like uh, our Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with a uh, high level of Taliban means uh, now China already recognized Taliban as the, you know, uh, the so-called de facto government. That's not the equal with that because we are trying, just trying to help, uh, the, you know, Taliban themselves now is in the process of transformation themselves. They want to change themselves from uh, some kind of this religious group and the uh, extremist group now becoming, uh, you know, a ruling a party, uh, ident you know, a political party in the future of Afghanistan. So we just uh, trying to get to know them better because we are familiar with Afghanistan Ghani government. So now we need the time and the chance to get familiar with this changeable, uh, you know, in the process of transformation, this mm -hmm. Taliban. So in the talk, I think our foreign minister Wang Yi made very clear we ask the Taliban to cut a clear uh, this uh, demarcation with those uh, extremists and stop, you know, have uh, no support to any like uh, uh, those Xinjiang, those terrorist group in Xinjiang. And also Taliban made the promise they will not allow any this kind of intention to use the soil of Taliban to make any attack to China. Mm -hmm. So I think all those messages are very good. And also, after this peace has been there, and China also uh, is willing to offer the help to rebuild uh, this uh, Afghanistan, to rebuild the peace and the development. This is uh, even, uh, uh, we have been talking about how to extend the One Belt, One Road uh, from Pakistan, uh, Pakistan all the way to Afghanistan. So we are willing to do that. So All I right. think uh, this meeting between uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi and the Taliban high-level official, uh, high-level delegation, I think is very uh, positive way. Okay. Uh, Mr. Khan, of course, Afghanistan is a very crucial country. That's why we've seen enormous amount of uncertainties in that region. 
and it is having a huge impact on all the countries in the region and even beyond. Mr. Khan, what do you think should be in that best scenario to achieve that? What's going to be the role of everybody? Well, I'm not sure how much of a role the United States is going to continue to play, uh, or for that matter, really Western countries. I think they've demonstrated uh, their uh, lack of understanding of uh, the geopolitics of the region. Uh, they have also demonstrated their uh, lack of uh, commitment uh, to the region. And whenever there is a regional issue, that is best left to regional players, those that actually share borders with Afghanistan, not ones that uh, uh, are thousands upon thousands of miles away, which then brings countries like Iran, uh, Pakistan, India, China, uh, and maybe some of the former Soviet republics to the north. One of the main issues that has to, of course, be then contended is that Afghanistan should not be uh, the playground for other regional countries' proxy wars. Uh, we found, unfortunately, that Pakistan and uh, India have used Afghanistan, leveraged and exploited it uh, in order to fight their uh, antagonistic relationship. Uh, you have Iran that, of course, is going to be concerned with uh, the treatment of the Shia population in the West mm. uh, at the hands of the Taliban. So they're going to feel as though they're stakeholders. And then, as uh, uh, Dr. Ho uh, has, uh, has uh, noted, uh, uh, China's rather ambitious uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, is uh, going through Afghanistan, along with its investments with uh, Pakistan through the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, the CPAC, as well as the 400 billion over 25 year commitment uh, in investment that they've made with Iran. And so I think what we're seeing here then is two things. One is that China is not necessarily concerned about ideological issues regarding the Taliban and uh, and other players in the region, including Iran, which is a, the a theocracy. Uh, they're interested in stability and they're interested in consistency and continuity. And similarly, I think it's important to recognize that Beijing acknowledges that the Taliban are uh, pragmatic. They are not necessarily irrational players in the region. Uh, they're not ideologically beholden. After all, if they were, uh, they would not, in fact, be negotiating with Beijing. They would have some kind of theological or ideological uh, antagonism uh, toward, uh, toward China. But they are negotiating at a very sophisticated level. And this, I think, is something that, unfortunately, the United States and the, the Western uh, countries never really understood about the Taliban. Now, that's not a defense of anything that the Taliban is doing, particularly uh, the humanitarian crisis uh, that they are uh, uh, creating uh, within yeah. Afghanistan. But if we are to look at this in a geopolitical lens, uh, then it's important to go ahead and acknowledge what are the realities of the situation. But on the other hand, uh, Mr. Khan, just to follow up, uh, many would say it is also unfair. On the one hand, you talk about the regional players should not use uh, Afghanistan as a place of proxy war. That certainly is well understood. But on the other hand, many would say this has been a practice for decades, if not more than 100 years, that Western powers, quote unquote, some would say, coming into a region, stirred up, unable to bring it to stability and probably even more to chaos. And then the regional players have to come in, like it or not, uh, to deal with the situation because their life and death are also on the line as a result of whether that region, stirred earlier by the others, are in peace or not. So uh, this is a very interesting topic that has been with us for decades. Mr. Khan, your thoughts briefly. I think it's a very, very valid observation that you make. And the fact that each of these regional players has a, a stakehold in the stability of Afghanistan as being a bigger priority than their own petty differences, mm. perhaps then provides us with some modicum of hope the destabilization of Afghanistan will have a ripple effect by creating then issues for India on its border. Certainly we've seen that it has had uh, a negative impact on Pakistan as well as Iran. And as uh, Dr. Ho has pointed out, there's already a, uh, a policy uh, consideration for China to protect itself from any kind of spillover into uh, its borders right. from Afghanistan. So if that it can be recognized by these regional players, then they will perhaps have the impetus to work together, or even if not work together, at least not work in opposition to one another mm -hmm. in order to uh, provide stability in Afghanistan. Mr. Furlow, only fair that I let you to come in and also comment about that. 
the relationship between the Taliban, Al Qaeda, Lashkar Tayyiba, and the rest of the terrorist organization has not been cut yet. Uh, this umbrella of support, this nexus of or ecosystem of terror will certainly destabilize the region unless the United States, the regional powers, including China, India, Russia, and of course Pakistan, pressure, pressure the Taliban to make sure that the, that the certain assurances and guarantees mm. are in place if the Taliban are becoming part of the ruling system in Afghanistan I, to, I to, to avoid uh, regional chaos by the extremist and by the terrorist organizations. Thank you so much, every one of you contributing from your own perspective. Saeed Khan, Tabish Faru, Jim Walsh, He Wenping. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.